The legacy media is now doxing and harassing individuals who supported the trucker convoy, and the Trudeau government admits it has no justification whatsoever to invoke the Emergencies Act. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the program. So all eyes are on Ottawa right now. We are watching and waiting for something to happen. You know, the prime minister issued this Emergencies Act on Monday. It has now been three days and yet they haven't done anything. So I'm not sure how much of an emergency it really was if it took them three days to get around to actually trying to implement it. Regardless, it's been three days, three days since the prime minister took that unprecedented step of declaring a national emergency. Now, unlike the ongoing emergency that we've been living through since the COVID pandemic first began two years ago, this new emergency allows the prime minister to use wartime measures to quash its enemy. In this case, its enemy is a group of working class Canadians who are peacefully protesting near Parliament Hill. The Emergencies Act is supposed to be reserved for instances where the sovereignty of Canada is at risk, not simply because the Prime Minister doesn't agree with a group of protesters peacefully assembled in Ottawa. Let's be clear about something. There are no current blockades going on in Canada. No bridges, no border crossings are being blocked. That all ended using the existing powers available to police. And yet, the more we hear from the Trudeau government about why they invoked this Emergencies Act, the more it becomes clear that they had no justification whatsoever in invoking it. Instead, it's clear that this drastic and unprecedented power grab is all simply because Justin Trudeau does not like the protesters. Trudeau marched his public safety minister, Mark Mendicino, out in front of reporters on Wednesday to try to spin a tale of how the arrest of four men in southern Alberta who had weapons and apparently a plot to ambush police officers, how that was somehow tied to the protesters in Ottawa. Take a look at this. And as we know, the RCMP made 13 arrests earlier this week at the Coots border crossing and seized a significant number of lethal firearms, a large supply of ammunition, body armor, high capacity magazines, and a machete. And yesterday, four men were charged by the RCMP with a conspiracy to murder officers. As the deputy commissioner of the RCMP noted, and I quote, Monday's weapons seizure and subsequent arrests speak to the serious criminal activities taking place during the protest and illegal blockades. The dangerous criminal activity occurring away from the TV cameras and social media posts was real and organized. It could have been deadly for citizens, protesters, and officers. We need to be clear-eyed about the seriousness of these incidents. Indeed, several of the individuals at Coots have strong ties to a far-right extreme organization with leaders who are in Ottawa. So you can hear in that clip, Mendicino clearly says several of the individuals in Coots have strong ties to a far-right extreme organization with leaders in Ottawa. Those words have meaning. There's an organization. The people arrested in Coots have strong ties to an organization in Ottawa. So first, I want you to notice how he was reading prepared remarks in that last clip. He wasn't just winging it. He wasn't freelancing with his opinion. He was reading a statement that he had prepared that was meant to justify why his government was taking this unprecedented step and why it invoked the Emergencies Act. He specifically said that the individuals had strong ties to an organization with leaders in Ottawa. And keep in mind, this is the Minister of Public Safety. He's suggesting that the people in Ottawa likewise may have weapons and they may have some sort of murderous plot. That's the point that he's trying to get across. Well, something truly remarkable happened at this press conference next. When the minister is done reading his remarks, the media start asking him questions. Real questions, not the sort of usual softball questions we see the legacy media toss up at their friends in the Trudeau government. They didn't ask the minister to reiterate how bad the protesters were, how awful conservatives are. They didn't give him a chance to just repeat his narrow talking points. No, they asked real pointed questions to get to the bottom of the very serious accusation that he is making. So here we'll see an exchange starting with a reporter from the Globe and Mail, and she's asking him a very specific question. She wants evidence linking the four guys who got arrested with guns in Coots, Alberta, to anyone in Ottawa. How does that murderous plot with those individuals have a tie to Ottawa? That is what the minister just said. Please provide evidence. Then there's a follow-up that's even more pointed. Is there a current ongoing law enforcement investigation or are you just speculating? In other words, is this an opinion 
Or is there a fact here? Well, the minister looks like a deer in the headlights. No, he doesn't have evidence, it turns out. He was merely speculating based on things that he had seen online. He didn't expect anybody to actually ask him tough questions. Here is what that looked like. Okay, can you please clarify yes or no? Have you seen clear or been given or told clear evidence of a direct tie between the people who had the guns and the motives and plans to kill officers in Alberta and people who are in the demonstrations and blockades in Ottawa. The the charges that have been laid uh, in uh, Coots uh, will lay out exactly uh, what what it is that uh, the police believe and hope to, to prove in a court of law. Um, the point that is being made is that the rhetoric that supported the movement in Coots is very similar and stri strikingly similar to the kind of rhetoric that we're seeing not only in Ottawa, but right across the country. I, I yeah. want to follow up on Marika Walsh's question. Uh, I think that um, we need to be certain that it sounds like you are making the connection between the rhetoric of uh, suspects who you know are accused of attempted and conspiring to attempt murder in, in Coots, Alberta, and the organizers here. So is that what your conclusion is, or is that something that's backed up by evidence of an ongoing law enforcement investigation? No, I think you have it right. I mean, I think the pattern that we're seeing here is in the rhetoric that is being used not only in Coots, not only in Ottawa, but right across the country. So then it's your, your conclusion. It's, it's certainly, I think, the conclusion of many individuals and Canadians who are taking a look at uh, social media, and it's uh, extremely concerning. Oh, it isn't just his opinion. Apparently, it's the opinion of many. Not only does he try to equate the truckers with violence, even though there is no evidence whatsoever and there's no police report or investigation looking into that, he also smears the truckers, no surprise, as being far right, trying once again to divide Canadians and to scare Canadians into believing that the people who are protesting in Ottawa, Parliament Hill, are literal Nazis. And sadly, some Canadians believe that. And speaking of coots, where, yes, the police arrested and charged a group of men who were carrying weapons, and they accuse him of a conspiracy, very serious, very scary stuff. This hasn't been proven yet in a court of law, and we don't know if those four individuals are tied to the protests that were happening on the border. Well, this is what the scene actually looked like at the end of the blockade in Coots. It came to an end, peacefully, calmly, and with the deepest respect shown between both the officers and the protesters. Regardless of what the Trudeau Liberals are saying in Ottawa, this is what it actually looked like in Coots, Alberta. <laughs> that is what Justin Trudeau and Mark Medicino want you to believe is a violent, far-right insurrection worthy of the use of wartime measures. Okay, well, we still have no justification for the use of this Emergencies Act. Let's go to another minister. This is the Minister of Justice or the Attorney General of Canada, David Lametti. So Lametti was on CTV last night with Evan Solomon, and he really let the cat out of the bag. Solomon rightly asked Trudeau's Attorney General how he can justify using terrorism financing laws and weaponizing them against regular Canadians who donated to the truckers because they wanted their freedoms back. That is why Canadians donated to the truckers. How is it so that the Trudeau government can justify using terrorism laws against individuals who donated to this cause? Well, this is truly shocking. This is what Canada's Attorney General had to say. Look, you've just compared people who may have donated to this to the, the same people who are funding maybe a terrorist. I just want to be clear here, sir. This is really important. A lot of folks says, look, I just don't like your vaccine mandates and I donated to this. Now it's illegal. Should I be worried that the bank can freeze my account? What's your answer to that? Well, if, I think if you if you are a member uh, of, you know, a, a pro-Trump movement who's donating hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars to this kind of thing, then you ought to be worried. That's right. It's really just about your politics. The Minister of Justice of Canada says clear as day that your political views are what will determine whether you are arrested, whether your assets will be seized. 
If you support the former American president, then we will treat you like a terrorist. It's truly incredible stuff. That should send a chill down the backs of all Canadians, especially those of us who are naive enough to believe that we lived in a free country. And to Lametti's odd point, suggesting that some pro-Trump organizations donated hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to the truckers, well, that's simply not true. And the reason that we know it's not true is because there was a massive hack of the database of those who donated to the truckers over at Give, Send, Go. So if you recall, Give, Send, Go was the replacement campaign after GoFundMe, the much bigger tech company, decided to shut down the $10 million fundraising campaign because of political pressure from the Trudeau government. So GoFundMe shut down their account. Give, Send, Go was in replacement. Of course, a Ontario judge seized that money and wouldn't let the truckers have it. So all of the individuals who donated their money didn't actually go to the truckers. Well, regardless, somebody hacked the website and leaked 30 megabytes of donor information, including the names, email addresses, zip codes, and IP addresses, internet protocol addresses of those who donated. So that information became public. How did the media deal with this illegal breach of data and information gained through illegal hacking? Well, of course, they began weaponizing the information, doxing the individuals who donated to the truckers and used it to try to harass those individuals and get them fired from their jobs. Let the doxing begin. This is a report from Cosman Georgia over at True North. He writes, journalists and politicians share illegally obtained give, send, go data. Journalists and politicians have been tripping over each other to identify anybody who donated to the Freedom Convoy after hackers illegally linked donor data on Monday. Legacy media outlets, including the CBC and the Ottawa Citizen, have been pushing personally identifiable information on Canadian citizens who donated to the Freedom Convoy. The practice, otherwise known as doxing, involves publicly identifying individuals by publishing their private information with malicious intent online. True North has rounded up the most prominent figures who have engaged in the sharing of illegal data Names have been blurred out in order to protect their identities. So here is Gerald Butts, former principal secretary and best friend to the prime minister. And here he is. He says, quite the list of give, send, go donors from Toronto, a Ford government staffer and a bunch of U of T faculty and students jump out. And he retweeted an anonymous account that was truly doxic. This account, Toronto Watcher, was just going through and listing the name and the place of employment or the school of individuals who donated, including the amount of money that they put up. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable that this count has not been suspended by Twitter, that it is still up. But as of recording Thursday afternoon, as of recording this show, this account is still up. Well, it wasn't just Gerald Butts. Ottawa City Councillor Matthew Fleury also jumped in in the doxing game and began looking for people who worked for the city of Ottawa, even using his own government city database to try to cross-reference and to try to dox his individual. What a despicable disgrace of a human being. Next, CTV anchorman Graham Richardson tweeted on Tuesday that he was contacting individuals in the illegal gifts and go data leak. So here's a tweet that went viral with people criticizing him for doing this. He says, has spent the last two days calling local people who have donated to the trucker convoy, including a former MP, several business owners, healthcare professionals, and property development, trying to understand why they support this. Very few callbacks, you think? Someone's data gets breached and leaked online, and you're wondering why they don't want to call back a malicious journalist who's using that leaked information to try to have a conversation about why they supported the trucker convoy. It's just absolutely appalling what these people are doing. It wasn't just him. Dean Blundell, who is a radio host in Toronto, here he goes. So here's a give, send, go donor list. And he just publishes it all online as if it's just totally fair and reasonable to publish this information. Ottawa Citizen editor Blair Crawford, likewise, penned an article doxing the owner of a local ice cream parlor. After her name appeared on the donor list, the business owner was forced to close her store because she was receiving threats. And this is a tweet that went out from one of the reporters over at the Ottawa Citizen. This is just so cruel. So the reporter's name is Alison Ma. She's since uh, put her account in private mode because surely she was just getting so much negative feedback for this malicious tweet. But she wrote, the owner of Stella Luna says she regrets making her $250 donation to the truck convoy, saying she thought it was a peaceful grassroots movement. So just pause for a second. It is a peaceful grassroots movement, regardless of what the media and Justin Trudeau and the government are trying to to say it is peaceful. It's peaceful. There's no arrest. There's no violence in Ottawa. The idea that it's not a peaceful grassroots movement is a smear and a lie in the media. I'll continue with her tweet. She writes, 
She made the donation on February 5th when police were calling the protest volatile and dangerous. Sub subtext there, she deserves this. She deserves this. She thought she was donating to a peaceful movement, but at the time the police were saying that it was dangerous. So Allison Ma apparently thinks that it is okay for her to be harassed and her business to be shut down over a $250 donation. Give me a break. It gets worse. Frank Magazine continued to just openly publish the name of people who donated, including their pictures. This is truly true truly despicable doxing here. Uh, great journalism over there at Frank Magazine. Just completely trying to, what, ruin the lives of people because they chose to donate a cause that they disagree with. Really, really disgusting, despicable stuff. And there's more. There was a Ontario PC political staffer who was fired or asked to resign because it was revealed she donated 100 bucks to the truckers. $100. You're going to lose your livelihood, lose your job over a $100 donation to truckers. Unbelievable. Unbelievable the glee that these journalists have in trying to ruin people's lives because they have political views that they disagree with. My colleague Andrew Lawton here at True North wrote this. Remember when Trudeau banned anyone sharing the New York Post Hunter Biden laptop story because of its hacked materials policy? Odd that no one seems to mind journalists tweeting about donors to the Freedom Convoy, information they have because of hacked materials. Great question, Andrew Lawton, but of course, that's not how things work. How it works is if the illegally hacked material is bad for liberals or bad for Democrats, as it was in the case of the Hunter Biden story, then Twitter bans it and suspends the accounts of those sharing. And on the contrary, if the illegally hacked material helps Justin Trudeau, if it helps the liberals or the Democrats in smearing the working class people who oppose the Trudeau government, well, then the docs material, including the names and addresses of individual Canadians that can just stay up on Twitter with impunity. Must be nice to have rules that work like that in your favor. Now to get back to David Lametti's odd claim that some pro-Trump groups were allegedly donating millions of dollars. Well, that is simply not true. From the sleeked information, we can look at the data. We learned that there were 92,844 donations made to this fund, and it truly was a grassroots fund. Of those nearly 93,000 donors, only 686 of the donations were over $1,000. So the overwhelming majority, 99% of the donations were small dollar. There were no million dollar donations. And it's interesting to look at the breakdown because there was a lot of early hand wringing by people like Gerald Butts and other liberals claiming that this was almost an entirely foreign funded insurrection. Well, it's not true. It turns out that most of the funds, the majority of the funds came from Canadians. So while there were 52,000 odd donations that came from the U.S., which made up 56% of the total, and 36,000 from Canada, which made up only 30% of the total. When you look at the amount of dollars donated, $4.3 million from Canadians compared to $3.6 million from Americans. Okay, and meanwhile, while we're on the topic and speaking about foreign funded campaigns, let's compare that $3.6 million the truckers were given by American donors. And, and, and let's be clear, the truckers ever received that money. The money was stopped by an Ontario judge. It was stopped through political pressure from the Trudeau government when it was the initial campaign. So, so, so no one got any money, but the intent was there to give these truckers $3.6 million from Americans. Well, let's compare that to the environmental movement in Canada and what they receive every Every single year from American and foreign donors, thanks in large part to people like Gerald Butts. So this was a report from the Alberta government. The total foreign funding of Canadian-based environmental initiatives was $1.28 billion between 2003 and 2019. $1.28 billion flowed into Canada from foreign sources in those years from 2003 to 2019. The commissioner states the figures are significantly understated. This includes $925 million in foreign funded reported by Canadian charities for environmental initiatives, $352 million in foreign funding of Canadian based environmental initiatives, such as anti pipeline campaigns that were made in the US. And $54.1 million in funding was provided through grants, which were described as representing anti-Alberta resource development activity. So $1.28 billion. So forgive me if I'm not outraged and worked up over the idea that Americans 
tried and ultimately were unsuccessful to give these truckers a total of $3 million from over 50,000 people. Okay. Oh, and also speaking of foreign donors, let's take a look at Justin Trudeau, our prime minister's own family foundation, the Pierre Trudeau Foundation. So according to the Toronto Sun, in 2016, $1 million was donated by two Chinese businessmen. They were the same Chinese businessmen who were paying for cash for access private dinners with Justin Trudeau. The National Post had a nice little handy breakdown here. You can look at the total donations and the foreign donations to the Trudeau Foundation. Look at how that just spikes magically in 2015. Hmm, what happened in 2015? Oh, right. That's the year that Justin Trudeau got elected as prime minister. So it says donations went from 172,000 in 2014 up to 731,000 in 2016, a fourfold increase from 2008 to 2013, the foundation had no foreign donors, but it had brought in a growing amount of foreign money in 2014, 15, and 16. Foreign donations jumped from $53,000 in 2014 up to $535,000 in 2016, a tenfold increase. Well, we already knew that Justin Trudeau and his allies were hypocrites. They're willing to smear their opponents in any way possible and at all costs, including targeting business owners, female entrepreneurs, and grandmothers for the crime of donating $20 to the truckers. Well, Trudeau sunk to an even newer low, an even lower low on Wednesday in the House of Commons, keeping with this ongoing lie that the truckers are Nazis. He accused a conservative MP, Melissa Lansman, Melissa Lansman, who happens to be Jewish, who happens to be the descendant of Holocaust survivors, whose grandparents happened to escape the Holocaust and choose to come to Canada, choose to live in Canada, and now their granddaughter is elected as a member of parliament. Incredible story in and of itself, Justin Trudeau decided to accuse this woman of standing with the swastikas. Here is that clip. These people, very often misogynistic, racist, women haters, science deniers, the fringe. Same prime minister six years later as he fans the flames of an unjustified national emergency. So, Mr. Speaker, when did the prime minister lose his way? When did it happen? <laughs> Conservative Party members can stand with people who wave swastikas. They can stand with people who wave uh, the Confederate flag. I am a strong Jewish woman and a member of this House and a descendant of Holocaust survivors, and I have never made to, I've, it's never been singled out, and I have never been made to feel less, except for today when the Prime Minister accused me of standing with swastikas. I think he owes me an apology. I'd like an apology, and I think he owes an apology to all members of this House. Yeah. Despicable, unbelievable. Of course, Justin Trudeau didn't apologize. Apologize. Instead, he just left the House of Commons in the middle of question period. No big deal. What an absolute disgrace of a man and a prime minister. So at this point, we still have no idea why Justin Trudeau has issued the Emergencies Act. He has given no clear public justification for why this is necessary. And at the time of filming, which is again early in the afternoon on Thursday, February 17th, no trucks have yet been cleared from Parliament. And it doesn't look like those truckers are going anywhere. Let me just say, here's a scene from last night. This was shot by CTV journalist Evan Solomon. As you can see, these truckers are not phased. These truckers are not scared and they're not leaving. The party atmosphere continues. There are people walking around, enjoying food, waving their flags, singing, dancing, the usual scene that we have seen from Ottawa. It doesn't look like they are scared or intimidated. Meanwhile, the police are doing everything they can to try to intimidate these individuals to leave. They were seen on Tuesday afternoon walking around distributing notices, telling everybody to leave the protest area. Here is a interview with one of the truckers who received one of these notices. Yeah, uh, about mid-morning they came by and they delivered uh, these uh, flyers to all the vehicles on the street and uh, two police liaison officers. Uh, they wouldn't give me their names, I got their badge numbers, uh, but uh, uh, they were just putting these postings out to try to intimidate people. There was no tickets, there was no charges, um, it's just a propaganda on behalf of the government try to intimidate people to vacate the area, but nobody here is intimidated. There's uh, a lot of us that are very committed to this and a piece of paper isn't going to send us home. So it's not exactly surprising that the police are telling these individuals to leave. The notice writes, anyone blocking the streets or assisting others in blocking the streets are committing a criminal offense and may be arrested. This is mischief under the criminal code. 
What is a little surprising, however, is that there is a clip of police who can be seen handing out this notice to a journalist. Yes, a journalist. Here is what that looked like. Well, there's a lot of murkiness around this law and what is going on right now, but the Emergencies Act specifically exempts peaceful protesters. So to anyone who's there peacefully, who is not breaking the law, they presumably can stay, as well as journalists. Why would the Emergencies Act apply to journalists who are trying to report the story and convey it to Canadians? That doesn't make sense. The fact that that was handed to a journalist is wrong. So look, we're going to keep an eye on all things Ottawa and continue our coverage throughout this political crackdown. Entrepreneur's own Andrew Lawton, journalist Andrew Lawton, is currently on the ground in Ottawa as we speak, and he will provide updates as they happen. Okay, so I want to end the show today on a bit of a positive note, because I think the truckers are winning. They continue to accomplish incredible things, including changes to public opinion and the dropping of draconian public health orders, exactly what they wanted. And the more that Justin Trudeau overreacts, the more he loses, the more he is losing the admiration of the media and the international community. He's losing the narrative. He's losing touch with everyday Canadians. He's looking angry, out of touch and petty. Calling a Jewish MP a Nazi, that's a new low. Not a good look for Justin Trudeau. It did not come across well. I want to show you two of my favorite tweets about the incidents, both from journalists, but these are both heterodoxy journalists, not your typical woke one. The first one is Jonathan Kay describing a situation. He writes this. Self-described leader of genocide state and serial blackface enthusiast shrieks at Jewish woman about swastikas. If this happened outside of parliament, you would think it was a crazy person who was off his meds. That's absolutely right. Next, we go to Tristan Hopper, who writes for the National Post. He writes this on Twitter. Aggressively ignoring rolling blockades for two weeks and then invoking the Emergencies Act while calling my critics Nazis neatly sums up how I would run the federal government after 10 beers. <laughs> very, very funny and... It's true. If you take a step back and you think about what Justin Trudeau has done over the past few weeks, it will define his career. It is not a good look. It is not a good look. He does not look calm and composed. He looks unhinged and a little crazy. So aside from Justin Trudeau's ongoing meltdown, we also saw Ontario Premier Doug Ford announce earlier this week that the vaccine passport would be scrapped starting on March 1st. This is huge. This is a big announcement and a big sign that the end is near, that things are going to get back to normal soon. Next, despite Justin Trudeau's acting out, we have four premiers who are publicly opposing the use of the Emergencies Act. So Jason Kenney in Alberta, Scott Moe, Premier of Saskatchewan, Quebec Premier Francois Legault, which is big, which is key. Francois Legault said, we do not wish to have a state of emergency in Quebec. It's not necessary. And it's time to bring together, not divide. That I think that's really devastating to Justin Trudeau. And Manitoba Premier Heather Stephenson also opposed the plan. So you have four premiers loudly speaking out, saying that they do not agree that this is not a national emergency. And finally, this is huge as well. A group of Canadian premiers and American governors have signed a joint letter to President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau urging them to drop the divisive and unnecessary cross-border vaccine mandate for truckers. So Jason Kenney tweeted this out. He said, today I've signed a letter along with Scott Moe, Montana Governor Greg Gifforte, 15 other governors urging the president and prime minister to drop the cross-border vaccine mandate for truckers. We are writing to immediately reinstate the vaccine and quarantine exemptions available to cross-border truck drivers. We are deeply concerned that terminating these exemptions has had demonstrably negative impacts on the North American supply chain, the cost of living, and access to essential products for people in both of our countries. So it is clear the truckers are getting what they want. They're winning, they're peacefully making their point, and they're making their voices heard loud and clear. Their critics, meanwhile, have exposed themselves as being hypocritical, petty, and ultimately ineffective. The legacy media will never be viewed the same way by millions of Canadians, and Justin Trudeau, willing to use the full extent of his powers as prime minister, has accidentally revealed how weak he really is. The Freedom Convoy will go down in history as one of the most powerful and effective protests in the history of the Western world. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.